I'm here today with Professor Jan van der Winkel, who's the Chief Executive Officer of GenMab. We're going to talk about GenMab's lead monoclonal antibody, daratumumab, also known as Darzlex. And we're also going to ask Professor van der Winkel about his hopes and dreams for the future of GenMab and also cancer therapeutics in general in this fast-moving space. Thanks for coming in today. Um, Jan, hardly a week goes by without some kind of news flow on daratumumab. Can you tell us about uh, the compound, why it's so clinically and commercially exciting for you and for the rest of the cancer space? Absolutely, I'm delighted to be here and, and, and especially delighted to speak about daratumumab. It's, it's an amazing molecule. I'm working for over 30 years now on antibody therapeutics and uh, this is a truly unique uh, molecule because it uses at least five or six ways via which it can kill cancer cells. And it has shown to be unusually effective as a monotherapy. It's on the market now as Darcelex for what we call fourth line therapy. So the sickest of the sickest uh, patients with multiple myeloma. But it also has shown some very good data this year combining Darcelex with, uh, with Revlimid or with Velcade, two other great drugs in uh, multiple myeloma. And actually we have seen data which are unprecedented, never been seen before with any other combination of, of drugs. Uh, and then what makes it really exciting from a business perspective is uh, that um, the market is huge. I mean, it's already a uh, $11 billion market multiple myeloma, which will more or less double between now and 2023. We believe that Darcelex has all the characteristics to make it a potential backbone therapy for that type of tumor. And to make it even better, I could go on for hours potentially, and I will not uh, do that, I promise you is that, uh, that uh, because of the way Darcelex works, we think that potentially could be used also outside of multiple myeloma and other cancers. Uh, like uh, basically recently, we saw in the New England Journal like case reports, uh, it was actually um, uh, very recent, uh, that a patient with so-called NK T-cell lymphoma, which is a type of very aggressive uh, lymphoma, uh, it, uh, which is seen a lot in Asia, that patient responded really, really well to monotherapy of daratumumab was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that there's actually little hints that daratumumab can potentially be of use in many, many other types of cancers as well. So what are the, what are the clinical trials that are ongoing outside of multiple myeloma? It's a, a trial in, in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, three types of, 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 uh, of blood cancers, uh, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, um, and, uh, and uh, diffuse lens B cell lymphoma that is ongoing. There's a new trial in NK T cell lymphoma in Asia, in Taiwan, which is uh, basically we put on clinicaltrial.gov uh, uh, recently. And very soon there will be a trial in a solid cancer where we combine uh, daratumumab with uh, T-centric, the Roche uh, pd one uh, blocker. Because one of the ways dar daratumumab seems to work is by activating the immune system in cancer patients against their own cancer. And, and if that is true, Potentially you can combine it with other immune activators like checkpoint uh, blockers. And there's already uh, three types of checkpoint blockers which have been uh, scheduled now to be used together with daratumumab in different types of cancer. T-centric in both multiple myeloma and a solid cancer together with Roche. Durvalumab, which is the AstraZeneca uh, pd one antibody together with Celgene in multiple myeloma. Either with daratumumab by itself or daratumumab plus other anti-multiple uh, myeloma uh, drugs. And Obdivo, the PD-1 uh, blocker from BMS, will also be tested uh, as we speak in multiple myeloma. And I can tell you that the plans are to uh, go beyond that, to go to other cancers and test whether daratumab could potentially be of value also in these other tumors. So that all in all, I think, makes it pretty clear why uh, we are very excited about daratumab and also the, uh, the market is very excited about daratumab. Okay. And... Um it's partnered with Johnson & Johnson's Janssen. Mm -hmm. um, how has that partnership worked out for you? Are you, are you pleased with how that's unfolded? Uh, I mean, we are more than pleased uh, about that partnership because it's a partnership we closed in, in August of 2012. It was a very competitive process. We had actually over 10 companies uh, uh, trying to become a partner for, uh, with us for Daratumumab. Uh, and we had very minimal clinical data. And I can tell you that uh, Janssen was the most proactive in that whole partnering uh, process. They really made it clear that they wanted to become the partner for Daratumumab. They had an experience already in multiple myeloma because of Velcade. They worked uh, for over 10 years together with Millennium Takeda. A very good drug, uh, Velcade. So they understood the disease area and they were completely convinced that this could become a game changer already at that time with very minimal uh, clinical data. And they convinced us that they would be a wonderful partner. 
And I can tell you, up to today, they've done everything they promised us and gone very far beyond that. Uh, beginning of this year, we had like 11 clinical studies. Now we have 26 clinical studies uh, going very far north of 5,000 patients, uh, including in those trials. I can tell you, we could have never done that as a small biotech company with less than 200 employees, because Janssen spends probably around 1,000 employees every day on working on, on Daratumab, not all Janssen employees, but also employees at the manufacturers, at CROs, uh, because to man all these trials, I mean, some of these trials are in like 18 different countries in over 100 clinical sites, there's no way that we could have done that. And the good thing is, they do all of these trials in parallel, not sequentially, but all in parallel. So it's like a big, what I call, military engine now, uh, rolling out Daratumab in all of these different settings. Uh, and that is what you want as a drug developer. I mean, my dream is to make an impact on the lives of, of patients, especially on cancer patients and their families. And once you have a winner, and Daratumab, I think, is a clear winner, as it looks like right now, then you need to maximize the potential, because that's the story of biotech. Once you identify a winner, try to maximize it. And then, I mean, we could have never done this by ourselves. And we are delighted with Janssen and how they actually continuously push and aggressively move forward uh, the development of Daratumab. So they are wonderful partner to, uh, to work with. Oh, that's good to hear. Mm. So also in Genmab's late stage uh, pipeline, you have Ofatumimab, which yep. is partnered with Novartis mm -hmm. and has data in multiple sclerosis and also cancer indications. Mm -hmm. Where does that compound show the most promise, would you say, clinically and commercially? Ofatumab is a fantastic antibody. I can tell you it has uh, disappointed in cancer. I mean, we originally partnered it with GSK, which is a company not very focused on maximizing the potential of that drug. And, and actually what, uh, what didn't happen is that they didn't do combination studies with, uh, with drugs like Ibrutinib, Venclexta, and other new molecules, which really make a lot of impact now in the CLL area. The good thing is that Novartis is a cancer-focused company, so they now moved over, over to, to, moved over to Novartis last year. They're nicely broadening the label. This year we got a maintenance label in the United States. We got a, a relapse uh, label in CLL. Uh, but I think uh, Ofatumab will always uh, remain a very small drug in the cancer area because we basically uh, didn't do the, uh, mac the, the massive, expensive clinical development which was needed to, uh, to competitively position a drug like that. The good thing is that they are now moving, Novartis is now moving in two very large studies in relapsing MS, where we had sensational data already in 2013 in a phase two setting with a sub-Q formulation of Ofatumumab, essentially very, very small doses of the drug could completely stop the progression of, of, of the disease in relapsing remitting MS. And that is a massive market, potentially over $20 billion market. And what really keeps me on my feet is that Novartis recently put Ofatumumab, the sub-Q formulation for autoimmune diseases, on a list of 11 potential blockbuster innovative medicines uh, uh, developed by Novartis. So that really is, is very exciting. They have now started uh, one of two very large MS uh, phase three uh, studies. The second one will start very soon. And then the good thing is that they said, well, that they would w want to have the data early 2019, potentially get it on the market in 2020. As a sub-Q formulation, I think the drug has massive potential in, in, in autoimmune diseases like uh, relapsing uh, remitting MS and, and secondary progressive MS. And we have a double-digit royalty, so that could become a very strong income driver for the company going forward, but we have to wait a few years. Right, right. Okay, so Genmab in general, you've been with the company for a long time. You were the chief scientific officer beforehand. Yeah. Tell me about the journey that the company has been on, the highlights, some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. What stands out for you? I mean, the clear highlight is, of course, um, the, 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 the first time that we saw real clinical efficacy with, with Daratumumab, which we saw very early on already in mid-2011. Uh, I still remember that we began to see at the lowest doses where you could potentially expect uh, the patients to get enough drug to expect a clinical eff effect uh, from. We saw I, in every cohort, we saw three out of three patients responding. That was incredibly rewarding. And of course, the uh, a key milestone for me was, of course, November last year, when we got the very quick, rapid approval of, of Daratumumab as Dazalex in the, in the United States. Um, another highlight is in May 2013, where we got our first breakthrough therapy designation for Daratumumab. We now, in the meantime, got a second one this July for the for this uh, for the setting where we combine Daratumab with Revlimid or with Velcade. 
I mean, some of the challenging uh, times uh, for, for the company was, of course, the very difficult period between 2008 and 2010 where we had, uh, I was head of R&D at that, uh, that point, where we had to take the decision to dramatically restructure the company. We had to let go 70% of our employees, which is still one of the most painful and most difficult uh, periods I ever experienced in my uh, life. I hope to never see that again. And uh, that was based on, on yeah, a company growing too quickly uh, and, and basically had a spending profile, which is unsustainable. And uh, from the moment I became the head of R&D in, in, in April 2008, I saw that that was uh, going on and then took the responsibility to uh, actually help to get the company back under control. Um, and I think other highlights, of course, are uh, this year, we have some of our new bispecific molecules with an entirely new technology platform, the dual body technology, which I'm very, very proud of, which we actually developed in, in the company. Um, under my leadership as at that time the CSO uh, and then the first three molecules are now in the clinic uh, again with Janssen as a, uh, as a partner next year we hope to uh, bring into the clinic the first uh, bispecific antibody with the dual body technology which we own 100% ourselves also next year uh, we uh, hope to bring the first hexabody uh, based uh, molecule into the clinic uh, a hexabody DR5, DR5 with sensational preclinical data so I think there's more, uh, more um, uh, highlights than lowlights uh, in, in the company's history, but of course, as any company, of course, we also had our uh, challenging times, and that actually is quite normal. I mean, even when you look at uh, big success stories like Genentech, uh, Centocore, Immunex, all wonderful uh, companies in the end, they all had one or two near-death experiences, and we certainly had one or two at GenMob in the past. Yes. Everybody that speaks to you can see that you're clearly a scientist at heart. Mm -hmm. When did you? When did you realize that you were going to be a chief executive of a biotech company? I can tell you that, uh, that I'm still a scientist at heart. One of the things uh, GenMob is, is a fantastic innovation powerhouse. I think it's based on very, very good science. I mean, the two new technology platforms are based on papers we published in the top uh, three uh, scientific journal science, which uh, not all companies can say. But I realized, I think, from uh, probably from the uh, mid of 2008-9 uh, on, and I was also pretty good in seeing the business angles uh, for the company and I was being asked uh, a number of times by our board of directors whether I wouldn't want to be uh, stepping up to the CEO position. And I basically said no because I, was, I felt I had the perfect job. Uh, it was an area I could really oversee as head of R, uh, oversee as head of uh, R&D. But then in mid-2010, when I was asked that uh, for another time, I thought that was the appropriate time to really try to cha change the strategy of the company and actually reprogram it. I mean. This was uh, after what we now call the financial crisis in 2008. The markets were not any longer open to buy the companies like Genma because we had the habit of going back to the stock market uh, time after time until that uh, time. And I basically changed the business model, very heavily focusing on partnerships to generate income, which could then help the company to actually hold on to their own drug later on. And we actually now have 17 partners. We have seven pharma and 10 biotech partnerships. It's a fantastic model. And the company since 2013 is now profitable. It's not yet sustainably profitable, but we're very rapidly moving towards becoming sustainably profitable based on royalty income. So it's a sensational story. And I, I think I'm actually much better in what I do now than what I did as, a, uh, as head of, of uh, first preclinical uh, development and research and then all of the R&D. I think I'm much better at my place right now. But sometimes you have to discover that in life. Uh, I certainly never had a formal business uh, uh, training, uh, but I think I'm pretty good in, in seeing through systems and setting up strategies uh, for a company like Genmob. So I feel actually at my optimal strength right now. And where do you see Genmob in five years, in 10 years, in this, mm -hmm. in the bigger cancer therapeutics picture? Mm -hmm. Where would you like to see Genmob in the next few years? And our vision is that we actually by 2025 have our own product, which we own 50% or more in, uh, in product ownership, uh, having uh, to transform a, a type of cancer in a fundamentally uh, different way to make that uh, cancer into a, turn that into a chronic condition you can live with, with a very good quality of life. I really want to have developed that uh, product and then bring it to the market ourselves. 
and then at the same time have a whole pipeline of what we call knock your socks off antibodies, which are really what I essentially want to say leapfrog drugs, which are not incrementally better, but substantially better than what is, uh, what is the gold standard in certain types of cancers. And I think we can do that. I think we have over 20 programs active now uh, by ourselves or with partners. And we are going to, uh, we have the engine now in place to put one of these molecules into the clinic every year for the coming, uh, coming years. And after 2019, this will accelerate into multiple uh, molecules. We have a, a stable and increasing cash uh, stream by Darsalex and hopefully Ofatumumab from 2020, which will allow me to hold on to a product ownership for 50% or more. And the way I explain this is when the, we, we are going for a, a market which is like half a billion to a billion dollar market in like 2025 uh, or so, we can probably do the marketing ourselves, uh, do the commercial um, activities ourselves because in the future cancer patients will know really, really well which cancer drug is going to help them and cancer doctors will know this even better at that time. So you don't need this massive system which was used in the past with hundreds of sales uh, uh, reps and, and, and uh, medical liaisons to really push these, uh, these, uh, these drugs. It's more or less of uh, the logistics and the monitoring systems to really uh, bring them, to, uh, make them available to patients and to the, uh, the centers where these patients are being treated. I think we can do this in a very innovative way. Uh, we are innovators and I think we can also innovate the uh, commercial side of, of, of cancer drugs in the future. But the basis that you, is that you have a leapfrog drug which is substantially better than anything for that uh, specific type of cancer. And I'm confident that we can get there with the company. Great. Jan, thanks so much for coming in. It's been fantastic speaking to you and very best wishes for GenMab and its future. Thank you very much. It was uh, wonderful to be here and I hope to speak with you again very soon. Thank you.